Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Call that mu. You find mu if you have.
and it is calculated by looking at the distance of each data point from the mean, adding all those distances together, squaring those distances because you don't want your data pieces that are above the mean that would have positive differences and the data pieces below the mean that would have negative differences. You don't want them to cancel out each other. So you would square each of them and then add them all together and then divide by how many there are. So it's the average distance from the mean. Before taking the square root, that sigma squared, is, which is what's being calculated, is called the variance. And then if you take the square root of that value, you get the standard deviation. Sample, the variance in standard deviation is identified by an S. So you will see in your calculator, and I'll show you this in a few minutes, you will see SX, which is sample, standard deviation, and you will see sigma sub X, which will be population standard deviation. Your calculator doesn't know whether or not the data set that you put in is from a sample or for a population, so it gives you both. Notice the only difference is in population uh, standard deviation, you're dividing by N. In sample standard deviation, because it is from a sample and not the whole population, it divides by N minus one to be a little more conservative in, in estimate of the standard deviation since it's not for the whole population. Notice, and this is what I wrote before, if that is symmetric, it is most appropriate to use mean for the measure of center, but standard deviation for the measure of spread. If the data is skewed, it's gonna be more appropriate to use the median for your center and something called IQR for your measure of spread. And we'll talk about IQR whenever we talk about um, box plots. So I'm actually going to kind of move down and go over a box and whiskers plot and what you would do to actually move this down a little bit. what you would do to actually create a box and whiskers plot. You're going to find something called the five number summary. The five number summary is gonna be the min, Q1, which is the lower quartile, the median, Q3, which is the upper, quartile, and the max. So Q1, median, and Q3 help to create a box plot. So what you'll have, and you've probably seen these before, you'll have your min at one end, your max, at the other. The median is the line inside the box and the box is created by Q1 and Q3. And they're called quartiles for a reason because it separates your data into quarters. So 25, in fact, let me move this up. So 25% of your data will fall between the min and Q1. 25% of your data will fall between Q1 and the median. 25% of the data will fall between the median and Q3. And 25% of the data will fall between Q3 and the max. You are going to see questions on this, so please write that down. So, the spread of your data may be spread out, but there's still the same percentage of data pieces in each of these sections. So it doesn't matter how wide it is, it only matters that a quarter of all the data pieces fall in each section. 
The other thing referencing IQR, talking about the spread, and this is because, again, outliers will affect skewed data. It'll make the max much more high or the min much more low. So the reason the IQR, which is the distance of this box, the IQR, which you'll see down here, is calculated by the difference between Q3 and Q1, that kind of gives you an idea of where the majority of the data set is, as opposed to focusing on the whole data set since it can be um, skewed based on what's on the ends. So that goes back to this whole idea up here about the IQR being used as your measure of spread. So I'm gonna continue with this idea of the box plot. Your five number summary, Again, min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. I'll show you where you can calculate those. Then you will plot your five numbers and create your box. The median is also Q2. And then you have your whiskers from the box that go out to your min and max. You will be asked whether or not any of your data pieces is an outlier. And the definition is any data piece that's more than 1.5 times the IQR above the third quartile or below the first quartile. So you'll see here that this is how you calculate an outlier. And then if your min is below Q1, minus 1.5 times IQR, you have a lower outlier. If your max is above Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, you have an upper outlier. So when we actually get into the problems that we're gonna do, you'll see me go through the process of finding these numbers on the calculator. If you wanted to do them by hand, the same way that you calculated the median by finding the middle of the whole data set, Q1 would be the middle between the min and the median, and Q3 would be the middle between the median and the max. So I'm actually going to jump to section 2.5, and then I'm gonna come back to the empirical rule. These Q1, Q2, and Q3 also serve as something called a percentile. A percentile is the percent of data that falls below a given data piece. Um, if you fall in the 93rd percentile for a test, then that means that 93% of the people scored below you. So when you talk about percentiles, it always means the percentage below. Looking at Q1 and the picture that I showed you, well, Q1, at Q1, 25% of the data falls below. So that is the 25th percentile. The median, 50% of the data falls below. So that is the 50th percentile. Q3, 75% of the data falls below. And you can see that in this picture. So Q3 is the 75th percentile. The other... And, that, and so percentile is a measure of position, which is what section 2.5 is on. If you know how many data pieces there are and you know which number your actual data piece is, you can divide that by the total number and multiply by 100 and that will give you the percentile of the actual data piece and tell you what percent of the data falls below that. Another measure of position, which allows you to see where a data piece falls within its whole data set, 
is called a z-score. A z-score tells you how many standard deviations a data piece is away from the mean. So the way that you do that is you take your value, subtract your mean, and divide by your standard deviation. So that'll give you the number of standard deviations your data piece is from the mean. So z-scores, a z-score of zero means the data piece is at the mean. A positive z-score means the data piece is above the mean. because your data piece minus the mean, if that gives you a positive number, then the data piece was bigger. Hope that this kind of helps it make sense. A negative z-score means the data piece is below the mean. And hopefully that makes sense because if the first number is smaller, when you subtract, you'll get a negative number. So in part of what you'll do, you'll need to interpret a z-score. So to interpret a z-score, so if my z was negative 1.7, then I would say my data piece and I put that in context if I was actually dealing with a problem, is 1.7 standard deviations below the mean. So that's where my negative part would come in, using the word below as, a as opposed to saying my data piece is negative 1.7 standard deviations. You would not put negative 1.7 there. Just the negative indicates you're below and not above. And then the last thing that I want to go over is something called the empirical rule, which allows you to kind of see the breakdown of a data set. Let's see if I can get all of this in here. The empirical rule is only with symmetrical data. And this is kind of a guarantee if you have uh, what we'll call approximately normal data or symmetrical data. And that is that approximately 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. So that means if the mean is in the middle, if I go out one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above, I will encompass approximately 68% of the data. Because of that, you can see, again, if this is symmetrical, that that is subdivided into 34 and 34. The second piece of information is that about 95% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. So if I go out two standard deviations above and below, that's 95% of the data. Well, since I've already encompassed 68%, do the math, subtract 68 from 95 and divide it by two, you can see that I have 13.5% on the lower end and 13.5% on the upper end. The third piece of information the empirical rule says is that about 99.7% of the data lies within three standard deviations of the mean. So again, if you do the math, you're left with 2.35% of the data on the lower end and 2.35% of the data on the upper end. That still is only 99.7% of the data. So the actual end is 0.1%. 5% on each end to get the whole 100%. Anything outside of two standard deviations, any data beyond two standard deviations of the mean, 
is unusual. So you'll be asked, is the data piece unusual? Well, figure out what the range is for two standard deviations above and below. If your data piece is outside of that range, then it's unusual. Outside of three standard deviations is very unusual. And so again, you'll see in some of the problems that we do, how all of this can be used to answer questions. So, we are now going to look at some examples of problems that go along with sections 2, 3 through 2, 5. The first one is the following sample of 20 test scores was recorded for a statistics final exam. Use this data to answer questions 1 through 21. So, I have my set of data here. And I want to first put that data in my calculator and then I can answer all of these questions. Um, to do that... Let me get this data pulled up. And I'll show you where to put it on your, cal on your calculator. So we wanna go to Stat Edit. All right, so we're going to go to Stat, Edit. Notice I still have data in there from the last time. So just a reminder, you can hit second plus four, and that will clear all your lists. So again, I'm going to go into Stat, Edit, go into List 1, and put in my data. 35, 80, 60, 81, and again, this is on your module one document, so you can follow along. 61, 85, 64, 86, 67, 87, 68, 87, 69, 90, 71, 94, 77, 96, 78, 99. Again, like I showed you in the other video, you can go to stat, go down to number two and sort list one. So now my data is all in order. At this point, I want to go in and um, calculate all of those sample statistics because this is a sample of 20 exam grades. I want to I want to calculate all those sample statistics. So this is where you go to do that. You're going to hit Stat, go over to Calc, One Var Stats. There should not be anything in the frequency list. If you have an older calculator, you'll need to just hit second one because all that will come up on your calculator is you'll see one var stats. But if you have a newer one, it'll actually prompt you. 
And so you'll see here, I have a list of information. I've got X bar, the sum of the X's, the sum of the X squareds. This S sub X is what I was talking about earlier. That's your sample standard deviation. Sigma is your population standard deviation. And then if you scroll down, hit the down arrow key, you'll see that five number summary that we talked about. The min, the Q1, the median, the Q3, and the max. So we're gonna go back to the document and answer these questions. Using the above, find each of the following and we're gonna to round to two decimal places. If there's a, I'm gonna put you symbols that go along with this so that you'll know what, what each of them would look like. So the sample mean, oops. So the sample mean is X bar. And in this case, X bar is 76.75. Oh, excuse me, I apologize, I didn't read well. X bar is, excuse me, that's the sample size. Sample size is N and there are 20 data pieces. So N is on your calculator as well. The mean is X bar because this is a sample. And that is 76.75. The median, if you scroll down, is 79. And we just use MED for that. The mode, if you go through the data and look at the number that occurs most often, the mode is 87. There's no symbol for mode. The standard deviation, we're going to use the S sub X. So that will be, so this is S sub X, and that is 15.273. Variance would be that number squared. Your calculator does not give you that number so you're going to have to just take the 15.273 and square it to get your variance, which is 233.265. The range does not have a symbol either, but you'll go through your list and take your max, which is 99, minus your min, which is 35 and 99 minus 35 is 64. The first quartile, which is your Q1 is 67.5. The third quartile, which is Q3, is 87. The IQR, or your interquartile range, you do 87 minus 67.5, and you get 19.5. Using the IQR rule to determine if there are outliers, I'm gonna take 67 minus 1.5 times 19.5, and then I'm gonna take 87, excuse me, that needs to be 67.5. And then I'm gonna take 87, which is Q3, and add 1.5 times 19.5. So on the lower end, I get 38.25. And on the upper end, I get 116.25. My min was 35, so that's not below 38.25. My max was 99, that's not above 116.25. So there are no 
outliers. For number 12, what percent of any data set is between the first quartile and the median? Well, if you think back to the picture I drew, it doesn't matter how much data there is or how many pieces. Between Q1 and the median, there will always be 25% of the data. This is not the empirical rule. This is based off of the box plot percentages. What percent of any data set is between the median and the third quartile? Again, that is 25%. Number 14, so we've already got our five number summary. The min value was 35, Q1 was 67.5, the median was 79, Q3 was 87, and the max was 99. Number 15 wants us to construct a, construct a stem and leaf display. So we're gonna go back to section 2.2 for this. Our data went from 35 to 99. So we're gonna start with a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So looking, and this, this is why having the data in order helps. So we have 35, we have no 40s and no, no, yeah, no 40s and no 50s. We have 61, 64, 67, 68, 69, then 71, 77, 78, and 80, 81, 85, 86, 87, 87, then 90, 94, 96, 99. And count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, Oops, I missed something. And that's why you go back and check yourself. Oh, I missed a 60. So let me. Zero, one, four, seven, eight, nine. There we go. In the next section, again, this is review from section 2.2. We want to do a um, frequency distribution with six classes. So we're going to take our range. So our range is 99 minus 35, and we're going to divide by six. And I get 10.6 repeating. So we're going to round that up to 11. So 35, add 11 to that, 46, add 11 to that, 57, add 11 to that, 68, add 11 to that, 79, add 11 to that, 90. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is 45, 56, 67, 
78. Eighty-nine, one hundred. So now to calculate the frequencies, there is one data piece between 35 and 45, zero between 46 and 56, six, five, six, and two, which is a total of 20. So constructing a frequency histogram Sorry about that. I want to give it a name. So this is AP stat scores. My frequencies go from zero to six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I want to do the midpoints. So the midpoints would be 40, 50, excuse me, 51. Sixty-two, seventy-three, and these would again be the midpoints of each of my classes. Eighty-four and ninety-five. So my first bar has a frequency of one. My second bar has zero frequency. My third bar has a frequency of six. My fourth bar has a frequency of five. My fifth bar has a frequency of six. And my sixth bar has a frequency of two. So looking back at that, looking at the fact that the mean was 75 and the median was 79, and looking at the actual histogram, you can tell that the shape of the distribution is approximately skewed left. So because of that, the median because the data is skewed, would be the best measure of center. To find the z-score for 96, if z is equal to x minus mu over sigma, 96 minus 76.75, divided by 15.273. That gives me a Z-score of 1.26.
So 96 is 1.26 standard deviations above the mean. For the z-score for 35, again, I'm going to take x minus mu over sigma. Actually, let me change these because this is sample information. So I'm actually doing x minus x bar over s. I want to have the right symbols. So 35 minus 76.75 over 15.273. And I get negative 2.73 for my Z scores. So that gives you kind of a review on sections 2.2 two and 2.3 with and 2.4, calculating all of those different characteristics on a set of data. The next section is kind of what you would do with a weighted average. And I'm actually going to show you how to do this on the calculator as well, so stay tuned to that. <clears throat> so at each of these, I would take... 97 times 10 percent, so 97 times 0 0.1, which would be 9.7. 100 times 10 percent, or 100 times 0 0.1, would be 10. 89 times 0 0.3 would be 26.7. 100 times 10% would be 10, and 92 times 40% would be 36.8. And so if I add all of those together, 9.7 plus 10 plus 26.7 plus 10 plus 36.8, I get 93.2. This is the weighted mean. You do not add the scores and divide by five because they are weighted. If I wanted to do this on the calculator, I can do this. And again, I'm gonna clear my list. I can do this by going into stat edit. I can put my values, my scores, 97, 100, 89, 192, and then I can put the percents 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.4 into list two. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to stat calc one of our stats, but before you hit enter, I'm going to change the frequency of my list to list two. So what that allows me to do is to do the whole multiplication before I add. And you will see that you get the average is 93.2, which is exactly what I got whenever I multiplied them individually and then divided. Or I actually multiplied them individually and added them together. the 93.2. So what two parts of the course had the most weight when calculating the course average? Well, the highest would be the exam and the final exam. Or the midterm exam and the final. Suppose the student made a 72 instead of a 92 on the final exam. So now I'm gonna go back to the same thing. I'm gonna change the 92 to a 72. Change the 92 to a 72. I'm going to go to stat, calc one of our stats. Make sure I've list one and list two. If your calculator just prompts you one of our stats, then hit second L1, comma, second L2. And that would change the average to an 85.2.
one more weighted problem. So my grade A student received the grade shown below. I got an A in a four credit course. I got B's in two three credit courses. I got a C in a three credit course. And I got a D in a two credit course. Now, if you look at the grades and what they're worth, an A is worth four points, a B is worth three points, a C is worth two points, and a D is worth one point. As far as hours go. So now if I multiply individually, 16, 3 times 3 is 9, 3 times 3 is 9, 2 times 3 is 6, 1 times 2 is 2. Which is 42. Divided by the total number here, which is 4, and 6 is 10, 11, 12, 13. And 42 divided by 13 is 3.23. And this is how your GPA is actually calculated. If I go back to using my calculator, I'm going to put 4, 3, 3, 2, 1. And then the actual credits that I would get, 4, Go back. 